Advancing the cause of liberty takes more than just coming up with ideas. It means making them happen. This is Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Well, in today's episode of Society and the State, uh, Connor and I are very happy to welcome Dr. John Lott to our podcast. And uh, Dr. Lott, you're a familiar name, I'm sure, to Connor and to me. But for people who are meeting you for the first time, most often I think they're going to associate your name with uh, you're the guy who has done a lot of studies and and talks about gun control. But uh, I'm sure there's more to you than that. Can you fill in some of the blanks for us about uh, who you are and what you do? Well, I'm an economist. Uh, I have a PhD in economics from UCLA, been an academic most of my adult life, uh, had positions at the Wharton Business School, University of Chicago, Yale, Stanford, uh, Rice. Um, I was chief economist at the U.S. Sentencing Commission in Washington. And, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work on a variety of topics, uh, I've uh, written on everything from education to uh, industrial organization to um, uh, labor economic type issues as well as crime. And um, but as you say, I'm probably best known for my work on uh, on crime. Uh, I've written nine books, uh, covered everything from. Uh, multiple books on uh, gun control, but I've also written a general book on edu- on economics, and I've written on, on other topics such as uh, uh, antitrust policy. Dr. Lott, I was just going to say that I've, I'm familiar with your work, uh, More Guns, Less Crime, and when I read that, it seemed to turn a lot of uh, conventional wisdom on its head about the connections between gun ownership and crime. I'd like to ask, though, for a bit of background, what is it that drew you? It sounds like you're a much more... Uh, broadly versed uh, economist, what is it that drew you in particular to begin to study uh, the topic of crimes and, and gun and, uh, guns in particular? Well, I was uh, teaching a class at the Wharton Business School uh, that dealt with crime, uh, more white collar and corporate crime. And uh, a couple of students came up to me after class one day because I had made the mistake of saying that we were ahead in the syllabus. And they asked if I could talk about gun control a bit. And I said, okay, but it kind of forced me to look at um, some of the literature in the area. And while I've been familiar with some academic papers that I thought were poorly done, I guess I had always assumed that there was better quality work out there. And when it, I started going through the literature, I was kind of amazed how badly done everything seemed to be in the area. And When you're an academic, uh, one of the reasons why you do work is either because uh, you have some new idea, which is usually what I try to do, or uh, you think you can do a better job, which was the case here. And, uh, you know, one thing kind of led to another. I started looking broadly uh, at many different types of gun control, about 13 different types. I ended up focusing on uh, on consistency. Carry simply because it was the one that really seemed to make the difference in terms of changes in crime rates. And um, anyway, so I wrote up a paper, though I almost stopped about six times because I didn't find it that interesting. And uh, uh, and I ended up getting a call from a guy named Dennis Kushan, who was uh, who worked for USA Today, and uh, Dennis had gotten to know me a little bit when I was chief economist at the U.S. Sentencing Commission in Washington, and uh, uh, he had asked questions about what he was working on. At the end of the conversation, he said, well, what are you working on? And I mentioned this paper, and he said, well, why don't you send it to him? So I did, and about a week later, he ended up writing a big article on USA Today, uh, was on the front page. And it got a lot of attention, and uh, there were a lot of attacks, and kind of things went off from there. It was just something that I could never really get away from completely because uh, people were always a lot of gun control advocates were attacking it. And but more importantly, I kind of 
got brought into the debate and I realized how much incredibly inaccurate and uh, misleading statements that were being made about the gun issue and that kind of, uh, I don't know, I kind of convinced myself nobody else would be at you know, properly responding and explaining why those statements were false. And so it kind of kept me in the debate. Well, it seems like gun control has been rolled back considerably since the time that you first released your book, uh, More Guns, Less Crime. I mean, you have uh, a clear majority. What is it, 42 states now that issue concealed carry permits? And just within the last week or so, um, a D.C. Court of Appeals struck down Washington, D.C.'s good reason law uh, for obtaining a concealed carry permit, can can you comment on on that direction? Is it, was that something that you foresaw coming? All the states have laws on the books that allow concealed carry, so I, I assume that's what you mean. Sure. But um, you know the courts uh, have been kind of slow, except for the Supreme Court, uh, to deal with these issues in a clear way, and. Um, uh, my own guess is that this D.C. opinion from last week isn't going to make a huge difference because uh, uh, D.C. is going to appeal it for an en banc decision, uh, which basically means the entire appeals court uh, for D.C. will will hear the case. And people have been very divided along party lines on this. You can pretty much predict how judges are going to vote based on who appointed them. And the Democrats hold a clear majority on the uh, D.C. circuit um, after uh, the nuclear option was pulled. In fact, the reason why the nuclear option was pulled was the Republicans were uh, kind of worried that Democrats were going to pack the um, uh, D.C. appeals court, which is pretty much what they did. It had been divided evenly between Republican and Democratic appointees up until that point. But my guess is uh, uh, the uh, decision from last week is going to be overturned. And uh, and then the question is whether uh, the Supreme Court will listen to it. But so far, uh, for a number of years, since uh, 2010, they've kind of refused to hear any real gun cases. So, but I mean, generally, You've had two trends that have occurred. There have been most states um, have been liberalizing their laws. On the other hand, you have places like California and New York and uh, a few other uh, states which are moving dramatically in the other direction. So, for example, California has a new uh, law that was enacted by ballot initiative last November that requires a background check. Every time you buy ammunition, you're limited to 100 rounds of ammunition, and it's probably going to be about a $70 or so fee uh, to go through the background check each time you buy 100 bullets, which is a pretty dramatic increase in the cost. I mean, you can buy 100 bullets, uh, let's say 22s, for $12, but you'll probably have to pay an additional $70 wow. to go through the background check on it. And... Um, and California has so many other regulations that they've been adopting over the last few years. They really make it extremely costly. And they're mainly, I think, uh, preventing poor people uh, in high crime urban areas of California to be able to legally own guns um, for protection. Dr. Lott, I find the connection really interesting between the increase in gun ownership and then the decrease in crime that you've analyzed a lot. But another thing I think that is even more interesting to me that you've analyzed is the bias in the media. And the question I assume you're often asked is, you know, if, if the use, if the defensive use of a firearm occurs as often as you and others claim, why is it that we never hear of, you know, even one story in the media? We hear all about, you know, bank robberies and gang shootings and whatever, but we don't hear about defensive use. And, and yet you're claiming, as I understand it, that this is a, a far more widespread thing than people are led to believe. How do you respond to that question about why we never hear of those stories? Well, there are multiple ways of dealing with this. One is, uh, I'll just say, you can go to our website at crimeresearch.org, crimeresearch.org, and uh, we have a list of mass public shootings that have been stopped by concealed carry permit holders. I mean, these are dramatic cases. Uh, you have a case where at a volunteer fire department, they're having Children's Day. 
uh, giving kids rides on fire trucks and giving them ice cream and playing other games. And um, a man comes up, starts shooting, and fortunately there are two concealed carry permit holders that are there, and they stop him. Uh, outside of local South Carolina news, though, it doesn't get news attention. Uh, you have cases from Chicago and Philadelphia where police or sheriffs or prosecutors will say that uh, if it wasn't for the presence of a concealed carry permit holder, many people would have died. Um, you know, it, I have dozens of cases on our website where mass public shootings in recent years have been stopped by permit holders, and yet you never find those cases getting national news. There was a case about a year or so ago uh, in Georgia where um, uh, there was a shooting at uh, a liquor store. Um, two people were killed by the shooter there. A uh, permit holder was walking by outside, heard the, the shots, came in, exchanged fire with the gunman there, and the gunman ran away. Uh, the sheriff there says he's, there's no doubt in his mind that the person saved many lives. The interesting thing about that story, it was actually on tape. They had uh, uh, a video camera there in the store recording the entire incident. And I thought for sure I could get national news coverage on it, given that there was a tape of it. But yet I couldn't get coverage on that. Uh, I would approach uh, you know, producers or editors, and their response was that it would be political for them to go and put a story like that on the news, even though – you have the video, people can see for themselves what happened, and you have statements from the sheriff there saying that um, many more people would have died if it wasn't for the permit holder. So, you know, a lot of this debate, I think, I think our debate on guns would be dramatically different if even a few of these mass public shootings, uh, it was mentioned that they keep on occurring time after time in gun-free zones. That's usually the easiest thing for reporters to figure out, you know, was there a sign? There? Was it a place where people were legally able to carry? Uh, you, you have virtually all of these mass public shootings occurring in places where general citizens are forbidden from being able to legally defend themselves. Uh, you have statements from these killers uh, many times explaining either in diaries or other places why they picked the target that they did. And many times uh, they point out that it was because they wanted to go to a place where they knew victims couldn't defend themselves because that would make it easier for them to go and kill lots of people. Um, but those types of things never get in the news. And I think it has a real impact. Instead, uh, what you see covered in the news is what type of gun that was used or how he obtained the gun. Uh, many of those times, those stories are wrong. They have to go and run corrections if right. they do bother correct it later. One of the questions I had is, as an academic, I wondered if you often find it frustrating that these debates focus more on emotion than economics. How is it that we get people to understand the data rather than just you know worried that it's a you know semi-automatic rifle? How do you inject the reason and and uh, an ac into an academic debate and pull the emotion out of it? Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess you can just keep trying to explain things to people. I mean, there's so many different levels that there's misinformation about. Um, some people seem to think that the types of weapons that are being used here are different than other types of guns. So, you know, people focus on the term assault weapon, uh, not realizing that the types of guns that are used here are functionally identical to any type of semi-automatic hunting rifle, firing the same bullets with the same rapidity, doing the same damage. If one wanted to go and debate banning all semi-automatic guns, at least there would be something logical there. But instead, they want to ban certain semi-automatics based on how they look on the outside and not based on how they function. Personally, I don't think they want to go and debate things like banning all semi-automatics because a lot of people would realize uh, most guns in the United States are semi-automatics and that uh, there's a reason why civilians themselves benefit from having semi-automatic guns. Uh, it'd be much more difficult for them to defend themselves if you had 
single shot guns that they had to manually reload themselves after each shot was fired. But look, um, uh, you know, a lot of it, I just think has to do with the press coverage and the press has a certain template, uh, that they believe things work in a certain way. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, they'll go and only interview one side of the question on lots of these things. And I think uh, people are done a real disservice. Uh, the gun control groups themselves kind of uh, help push that. I can't tell you, and I in the book, The War on Guns, um, I go through and give some examples of this, but um, you know, I'll get a call from a TV channel, a cable channel, to be on and do a debate with somebody from like every town, Michael Bloomberg's every town. And I'll get a call as I'm driving into the station saying, Oh, we have to cancel because uh, the Bloomberg people don't want to debate you. Uh, or they'll ask, is there somebody else that you can suggest that has the same views that you do that we could have on? And um, I mean, I can't even imagine demanding, um, uh, that I get to choose who I get to debate on these types of TV shows, but, you know, or they'll say that they just don't want to debate anybody. They just want to be on by themselves and the media uh, lets them do it. And, uh, or generally, I mean, there's a couple of exceptions. Well, you should, um, you should take it as a compliment. That means you're a formidable uh, opponent when it comes to debating the issue. You've done your homework, obviously. Right. Well, I'm, I guess my major concern is just how well informed the public is then on these issues. But, uh, you know, you'll be on, I'll be on state of the union with uh, Wolf Blitzer and, uh, he'll be talking about the machine guns that are used in these attacks. And you'll, you know, here's a guy who's been covering these issues for 20, 25 years on these types of shootings. And yet, uh, you know, he doesn't even seem to know uh, what types of guns that are used in these attacks. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, people just don't know a lot or ignorance or I don't know what you want to say, but you just have to keep trying to inform people. To that point, Dr. Lott, about having an informed public as we uh, conclude here, you mentioned earlier crimeresearch.org, which is the website for the Crime Prevention Research Center. Can you tell our listeners what information they'll find there? What kind of stuff is the center producing that to help educate the public on this issue? Right. Well, we're a group of academics. Uh, we have a pretty prestigious board of academic advisors, and uh, we do work on a range of different issues. Um, you know, we basically know where the data is, and we've done a lot of academic studies on these types of issues. So um, we do our own original research. Just had a report come out a week or so ago about uh, concealed carry permits in the United States and how it's been growing and the changing demographics and how incredibly law-abiding permit holders are and a few other points that were there. Um, and uh, But we do work on everything from gun control to policing. Uh, we've just had some work that we did recently on uh, on police shootings. So, uh, you know, I hope people find it useful, but there's everything from data on the U.S. to international comparisons, things like um, mass shootings, showing that the United States actually has a lower rate of mass public shootings than uh, than most of the rest of the world. That's interesting, and it runs so counter to... Uh, the the conventional wisdom that the media is feeding us that it's this atrocious thing and therefore we need more gun control because there are too many guns and too many attacks in America. So I'm going to go look that up myself. I'd be curious to look at the data. We will link to that website, your books, um, and the other resources we've mentioned on today's show notes page, which is societyandthestate.com slash 17. Dr. Lott, we hope listeners go check it out. Thank you very much for joining us today. Well, I greatly appreciate your time. Thanks very much. All right, guys, so that's a wrap for today. As I said, that would be an interesting bit of data for me, uh, Brian. I mean, you're a fellow gun guy, right? But even me, I tend to think, well, yeah, we do have more of these shootings, but that's just a price we pay for being you know, an armed society that respects the right to keep and bear arms. But what he seems to be suggesting is that you know, maybe it's per capita or whatever. It's not quite the narrative that even I have been led to believe. 
I like the fact that uh, John Lott has gone out there and he has actually, he suffered a lot of slings and arrows for speaking up as he has. And uh, I think that's a, a pretty good sign. Some people would say, oh, he had opposition. Well, that means there's something questionable. No, flack means you're over the target. Well, that's something like we've talked about in the past that you, to, to look for the truth, you want to find the people who are challenging the narrative, challenging the power brokers, the status quo. And when you look at the hysteria on this issue of guns, I can't think of a better issue to you know, lean more towards someone who is up, upending the, the you know, politically correct narrative. So uh, fascinating books. It's been a few years since I read them, but I, I really enjoyed looking through this stuff to see how prevalent this stuff was. So we will link again to that on today's show notes page societyinthestate.com slash 17. Stick around for the next episode. Brian and I are going to be talking about that hallowed social contract. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com. 